We're here at the Fruit Street Bridge, which as you can see is still under construction. And we're going to meet Eric Weiberg, a world famous author and historian. How you doing, Eric? Great to meet you. Yeah. You're dressed like a bit of a dork, but <laughs> good to see you. You too. Yeah, good. So, so this is where the planes crashed. Tell us more. Sure. Well, we just learned from oral historians in the in the uh, Hopkinton area, which I mean, that's a totally thankless task. Think about it. You're going to people's homes. You're telling them to talk about stuff that happened 60 years ago. But the gentleman Joe, I forget his last name. He explained with his arms making kind of heart shape that as the two aircraft coming up from Quonset, Rhode Island, were heading north to a base, uh, uh, they were practicing their uh, dive fighting. And Smith, and I'm gonna call him Muncie, they, they collided the first time while, by fake fighting, which turned out to be fatal. And probably both would have survived if they hadn't, in the descent, then hit a second time. And that doomed one of them, Smith, to death and his plane crashed right here on these tracks, right here. And I know this because of a combination of tremendous volunteer support, uh, uh, people helping immensely to, you know, uh, describe where it happened and what happened in the death records in Hopkinton. I believe the record, uh, the, the town becomes another town a few hundred yards. So if the death certificate, so it had to have happened here. So the idea is for us either to go on the west side towards the next town, Southboro, or to the east where the gentleman had his death certificate. It almost makes more sense to go downstream from here. The only criteria that we're focusing on is roughly three or 400 yards south of the, uh, of the rails. The thing that mitigates against us is they didn't say that it was in the river or right next to the river or anything, and they normally would say that, um, but there seems to, we, it just, it's just seen as an area of the plane that went down it was in an area that was awkward, inaccessible, wet, swampy. I mean, they kind of left it that. See, these are, they're expensive, and I'm determined to use them. They're waders. I've never used them in my life, so I'm very excited. So what made you get into this? I mean, what's the sort of the short story of how you decided to start recovering planes and boats and treasure that other people could never find? Yeah, they, the word treasure is anathema. So, my dad helped people that died far from home. He was a consul. He helped, he was supposed to only help Swedes, but he helped anyone. He helped Swedes, Norwegians, Croats. My brother is the consul to Sweden in Bahamas. Our great uncle was Blix, the guy who said there were no WMDs in Iraq. You know, we've always been diplomats. We've all been sort of peacemakers. So, so we just feel strongly to like that. We never had a television. They threw out the TV. So it was all about reading and research. We all we talked about was World War II, World War II. My dad had seen the Germans go through Sweden in World War II, one of the great shames of Swedish history. And so that's really what happened. I was in the Bahamas, my mother was very ill and dying. I couldn't stand to hear her being in pain. So I would leave every dawn and go dive for this plane that I had found as a kid. And then I learned more that it was a World War II plane and I learned that there were two men who died. I, I met the niece and then the niece uh, who I will meet in Canada in a few weeks helped me and I found the plane and everyone said I couldn't do it and they were kind of belittled me and I did it. So then I said, well, I'm going to find every single type of this type of airplane. It's a little bit like Disney, the Jungle Cruise. You know? stone is the kind of thing I look for. See how it's flat? It just looks different. You know, these planes have all kinds of engine cowlings and um
That Hawkins and press is very hard hitting. I have never walked in waist deep water in a swamp like this. This is a this is a new experience for me. You can learn a lot from railway uh, history and um, it, like for example I did a book on the mailboat industry and nobody looked in the mail section. You have to study Filatelli and uh, so um, not terribly encouraging. Um, there's no, yeah, I know, that's where I'm going. What do you think? I'd like to go that way. I think we um, can. Yeah, my only question is, obviously we're not going to get a canoe through here. Nope. And we're going to let the, whoever is behind us in a large vehicle, let them go. Um, Tap Lagoon. So how old were you when you first, when you made your first discovery? My friend and I found an airplane with two wheels sticking upside down on the reef. I just thought, when you think about it, right? What would a truck be on a reef? Why would there be an airplane on a reef? Why would there be, you know, there, there are railways uh, trains in the Bahamas on the reef for smuggling to the south. So I just thought, it doesn't make any sense. I gotta figure this one out. And it took me about 35 years I ended up finding the exact names of the people who crashed and the relatives and I found out a lot about them. You're Swedish, but you also grew up in the Bahamas. So, so um, our, our grandfather was very successful and was a, pro, a politician. And um, he, uh, he, 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 his life ended suddenly and my father suddenly had freedom and money. And uh, when the tax man came knocking on the door, they suggested he pay something like 105% in uh, rich tax. And my dad said, well, I'm an attorney, and the idea, I'm the ninth lawyer in my family, by the way, we're all attorneys. I said, uh, my dad said, well, why would I pay you to rob me? I mean, that was the logic, you know? Why am I gonna pay you 105% to take all my money? He said, that doesn't sound like a great idea. So he went to Brazil, Bahamas, and New York. He found Bahamas was the only place that had no tax, and also uh, no military, basically, uh, that he, and uh, also no um, snow. Right, so he, he uh, settled in the Bahamas. My, my mother had four kids, represented Sweden, ran a hotel, sold it profitably a few years ago, and um, and I came up for boarding school. Eric has gone up ahead to scout. It looks like there's a clearing there in the trees, uh, but he's got the hip waders. It's a little too deep for me. This is some pretty uh, difficult terrain. <laughs> Walking on the railway tracks is easy compared to that. That was not easy. It makes you feel your age. It makes you feel clumsy disorientated, you take a few diggers, you're face down in the mud. It's not easy. So we didn't find the plane today. How does that make you feel? Are you disappointed in that? Or what do you think? I'm happy. I feel I've made a new buddy. You know, we've gone out in the forest together. We've had a good time. And now I can entice my son and his friends by saying, hey, you know, don't just go canoeing, but your dad can help you find a World War II plane, you know, you get credit for it. You'll be in the hop news, <laughs> you'll be in the news. And, um, but I, I never, um, sometimes, you know, the disappointments are when you're totally wrong. The disappointments come from when you've been lied to. Uh, the disappointments come when you prevented from getting in, either by lack of equipment. I, I was completely set to dive, dive on a 
D-Day wreck three days ago in Rhode Island, and I forgot my mask. I'm a, like a almost professional grade swimmer, and I forgot my mask. I'm like, I'm not going to West Marine. I said, I'm being told something. You know, it was crappy weather. I was alone. I had no wetsuit. It was a bad idea to go out. To hell with it. I didn't go. A lot of current. So I feel today was a great success. What you're doing, I feel we kind of narrowed down the field a bit. I feel that we got to, I was too afraid or, or sensible to go into that crap alone. That was very dense, a bit scary, very deep, very wet. Obviously, uh, a lot of sudden holes. I fell face down three or four times. And uh, even in the, in the river, it wasn't an easy thing. Uh, it was very exhausting. Once you get your equipment's all wet and you're pulling a canoe, it's, it's difficult. Do, you think, the, do you think the plane is there? I'm convinced the plane is there. And I was just discussing that you could be standing on the damn plane and not know it was there. That's the terrain. You're fighting the terrain. A lot of the time you're fighting the clock, exhaustion, dehydration, distraction. But in this instance, you're fighting the terrain. The terrain here does not want to give up its secrets. It is a swamp, it is a marsh, just as they initially said. And everyone's, oh, it's a cedar swamp, cedar, you never find it's in a swamp. And then you go out there and you realize, well, they have a point. It is a swamp. Now, I grew up in the Bahamas, playing around in swamps, getting golf balls out of swamps. This is pretty tough swamp. You got moving water, you got still water. Um, luckily, you got some animal pass, but some of it's very deep. So, you know, it's almost, you're either not gonna find it, or you're gonna need to narrow it down, right? To a, a, to a sort of, say, a half, quarter mile area, and get volunteers. And you get uh, ice cream, and you get some Kool-Aid, and you get 20 people, and you get uh, 10 or 15 of them to lock arms, every, like a police walk. Every 10 feet, you get a different person, and you just slowly walk. And that way you have the comfort of other people, you lock arms, you have camaraderie. Uh, Boy Scouts could do it, Girl Scouts have a civil organization, but I would suggest they be fit, whatever age. So I think that's how you're gonna find it. Or maybe, you know, one day, some hunter, some farmer, some romantic, some loner is gonna put their little uh, walking stick down and it's gonna go click, click, and they're gonna hear some metal and they're gonna find that plane. And when they do, I hope they call you and I hope they call me.